Okay, hi everyone. I'm re-recording this session because I think lots of friends missed it. So um, welcome to Nature's Numerical Playground, exploring math in your outdoor classroom. I'm Lauren McLean. Uh, today we're going to really dig into um, or step out of really the traditional classroom and immerse ourselves in the wonders of the great outdoors. We're going to explore a myriad of ways in which mathematics can come alive in nature and discover how to create an engaging outdoor classroom that is going to nurture mathematical thinking. I mean, definitely in this world of that is dominated by technology, uh, it's really more important than ever to reconnect with the natural environment and leverage it and its inherent educational benefits. We know that nature offers a bountiful playground. It's ripe with opportunities for students to develop a deeper understanding of mathematical concepts. So during our time together, we're going to embark on a journey to uncover hidden mathematics within nature's intricate patterns, the shapes, and the processes. So from counting and measuring objects in the environment to then understanding the applications of geometric principles in the natural world. We'll explore how we can seamlessly integrate mathematical thinking into an outdoor classroom setting. So let's get started. There we go. I love this term, the land that brought me up. It's something that I learned from my own Indigenous education department from my district, SD43. And so as a respectful acknowledgement of the land and waters we reside on, I gratefully recognize that I am situated on the traditional and unceded territories of the Quaquitlam First Peoples. I honor and give thanks to their ancestors, past, present, and future, for their enduring care and stewardship of this land and its resources. I hold reverence for their profound connection to the land, the waterways, and all living beings that have shaped these territories for generations. May we continue to learn from and respect the rich cultural traditions, wisdom, and resilience of the Quaquitlam First Peoples. Next, <laughs> back up again. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out again on Instagram or on email if you have more in-depth questions, but I do post a lot on Instagram what we're doing outside. Uh, silly reels, I like being silly, so uh, hope to see you around and thank you. Thanks for coming. Bye. So the learning intentions today, uh, I definitely have, hopefully correction, had math phobia. Why? I get nervous, I get panicked, uh, time tests make me uncomfortable, um, and I just, I know that figurative brick wall that goes up when we're exploring math for ourselves and with our students. I'm hoping that these mental blocks, uh, we can learn and see and witness that they fade into the background when we take our learners outdoors to explore math. We can discover the local plants native to our lands, and through those observations, we can uncover math concepts like patterning, shapes, and measurement. So let's see what else we can learn. Next. <laughs> there we go. Um, so I'm going to have two slides back to back just about nature routines, because similar to setting up any type of routine in our classroom, we can do the same in our outdoor classroom. And I think it's really important to have that vocabulary classroom, outdoor classroom. It really leverages it and shows the learners, the parents, the community that this is a valid, respected, important outdoor learning space. Um, we set up these routines slowly, just like we do inside, how to enter the classroom, how to do quiet reading, how to wash your hands. We do the same for all of these routines and each one of them can have a little um, mathematical twist to it as well. Uh, but the first one maybe doesn't have a mathematical twist, making sure you have a gathering place similar to your carpet area inside the classroom. I want to know that we always have a spot that we go out of the hallways and we meet there. Right now I'm having to lock the school doors and so I'm not at the front of the line. So I've shown them what the route is, meet right there in a semicircle. That's the gathering place. I've now locked up. I'm following from the back and that's always where we meet. So it's a wonderful routine. We walk, we're quiet. 
um, and we don't lose any students because it's a very short walk. <laughs> now, nature walks, not only does it promote physical activity, we can do a guided walk with a specific math prompt. We can leave it more open-ended, look for seasonal changes, look for colors, uh, but we're also really working and developing on our communication and observation skills. Our sit spot, I know I'm biased because of the book. <laughs> I love sit spots, but who wants to sit still? Nobody. Uh, so when we're first introducing this routine at the beginning of the year, we make it playful. Play camouflage, play hide and seek, extend the amount of time. Like I can see that boy behind the ferns there, but I'm not going to call his name yet. I want him to stay low, silent, quiet, because that instantly is extending the length of time that they're going to be at a sit spot, the more they can feel hidden from us. Now, in essence, besides just playing a game and starting slow, it's testing out different areas that they want to go visit and explore. I'm going to go sit by the boulder over there. Yeah, it's not a bad place. I'm not overly comfortable. So tomorrow I'm going to try sitting over by that nurse log or maybe on the blacktop surface closer to the library window because it's always going to be nice and quiet there. We visit as often as we can, maybe for just 30 seconds, maybe eventually five minutes, maybe longer. Um, we're going to notice, observe and document our thinking through journaling, which is our next routine. It's very similar to the routines of journaling and writing inside the classroom. We just have either a plain piece of paper on a clipboard or we actually have a nature journal. We haven't introduced that yet. It's still early in the year. Right now we're still just doing loose leaf paper, um, but eventually we will we'll slowly pick that up. Nature routines, again, circle is very similar inside and outside. We sit quietly or we stand quietly. We say our name. Hello, everybody. I'm eye contact. My name is Lauren. I'm really grateful for the cloud cover today. And uh, hello to my friend Alexa right beside me. Alexa says, thank you, Lauren. My name's Alexa. Today I'm grateful for da 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 da. Now we haven't done our nature names yet. But eventually it will be, hi, my name is Lauren, my nature name is Anna's Hummingbird, and I'm grateful for cloud cover. How we decide on a nature name is we go around, we observe and identify the plants, the trees, the birds on our school grounds. We Once we have identified it, we write it on a little piece of paper, put it into a basket, collect enough for each learner to select one or maybe a few so that they can exchange whatever, however you want to do it. And then that is the nature name that they can connect to through an inquiry, however you feel uh, that you want to extend that learning, but it's really nice for them to feel connected to something uh, as soon as they can. Field guides are something I never leave the school without. I've got like a class set, um, not of one type of field guide, but those pocket field guides, so they're fairly weatherproofed. I've got four trees, four mushrooms, three on tracking, one on knot tying. You can get them at almost any store. The Outdoor Learning Store is a really lovely Canadian local company, so I always love buying them from there. But where does the math live in that? How are your field guides organized? How are they sorted? The birds one have like a uh, one section for songbirds and it's labeled in red, songbird. The next page are all birds of prey. Maybe it's a blue title up at the top, I can't really remember. But what makes a songbird a songbird? How are they the same? How are they different even within that label of songbird? They're not all the same. We can do lots of storytelling outside. Think about your story workshop, how you can bring that outside and how you can then infuse math and stories working together at the same time. Uh, definitely recommend looking up Janice Novakowski and the work that she does on outdoor storytelling. There's also an amazing teacher in Delta. Her name is Alana Tassan. I would highly recommend following her as well. The last nature routine here is on tracking and mapping. I love finding tracks outside. Most commonly, it's just gonna be your domestic dog, but you see a track, you stop, you pause, count the number of toes, look at the shape of the metacarpal pad. Can your toes fit inside your metacarpal pad? 
what direction are they going? Let's measure how wide, how uh, long, how deep it is in the ground. How far away are the tracks from one another? Does that tell us if it's walking or running? And again, you don't have to know the answers to this, but it's nice to know what questions to ask. After you've found some tracks, mapping in your journals is a really wonderful activity to support the, um, the skill of social uh, relationships, <coughs> which is a really important math concept. Sorry, it's been a long day. <laughs> All right, next. Hmm. There we go. So uh, now we're going to go into exploring three different facets or sort of different ways you can think about your math program. Math inside, which is tried and true. It's not that I don't do math inside. That is an extremely important learning environment. Uh, I often introduce math concepts first inside the classroom where they're comfortable, they possibly will listen a bit better, and then we get to do something similar outdoors, which is the second uh, example. So we're going to take that math and we're going to bring it outside. We don't have to replan. It's the same curriculum, same planning, but now it's just a new environment. The third example there is a, more about nature as the math teacher. So it's guided by principles of curiosity, free explorations. We spend time outdoors actively observing and interacting with the environment. And then we're uncovering and discovering the mathematical concepts, patterns and, and shapes and geometry, uh, number concepts. And it really helps foster that deep appreciation for the math subject just beyond the confines of the traditional classroom. There we go. Now we're gonna, with all three different, uh, I guess, programs, it's not really a program, but all three examples, we're gonna go through the five facets of our math curriculum. So, or the math strand. So we're gonna go through number, computational fluency, patterning and algebra, geometry and measurement, and then data and probability. Doing great with the, there we go. Okay, so our first example, indoor math, we're gonna be exploring with numbers. So this was an example of an activity many years ago now when I was teaching in Richmond and I was so lucky to have Janice Nowakowski as my librarian. And she came in and did a, a little prompt for our K1 learners with that simple picture that said, can you stack five rocks with a basket of rocks? The big idea is how num how do fives and tens help us think about other numbers? The curricular competency we were focusing on was modeling mathematics in contextualized experiences, and the content was about counting on and sequencing numbers to 20. Uh, it was a very exciting activity. Again, we're doing one-to-one -one correspondence. Can they count to five? Can they balance? Uh, again, it seems very simplistic, but it was a lot of deep learning for those kindergarten students. We took that similar activity and we brought it outside. So again, can you stack five rocks outdoors? And the student in this picture, she did enjoy the rock activity inside, but I would say her attention didn't sustain for too long. But when we did it outdoors, her imagination led her to not only stack rocks, but she went and collected alder cones to stack, she collected sticks to stack and leaves to stack. Now it's not saying that she couldn't have done that indoors, but I think it's because our tables were so beautifully presented. Maybe she felt like she couldn't grab another material to extend her learning. And so that was a really good uh, learning opportunity for myself as the educator to make sure that I do encourage that inside as well. When you're done stacking rocks, look around the classroom, find something else that would be you're interested in counting and stacking. Now, other number activities that we do outdoors, that picture, her little uh, paper there, is a number scavenger hunt. So one of them might say, finds a nature object that comes in groups of five, like a salmon berry, the petals, or find seven cones. So lots of different ways that you can make that into a number-focused scavenger hunt. 
That middle picture, we also use calendar numbers like that to help us identify and then count objects outdoors. It's very similar to counting collections indoors. Now this was a group of grade twos, I think this picture was, and so they were making piles or trying to make piles, I think of 10 needles. And so there was one group of 10 needles. And then the other group, 10, so number two, there's another group of 10 needles. And so it was a easy way for them to keep track of their piles because it was quite a messy area. So it was hard to tell that there were 10 <laughs> needles in that area versus another area. Uh, that last picture there, there's some twine tied between two trees and we use it as a number clothesline. Now we have introduced that inside the classroom already to do a whole bunch of different open number line concepts. So I might hand out the number one to one student. I've already got the number five on the clothesline. I hand out the number 10. I ask those students to place their numbers somewhere on the clothesline and justify why they think it belongs in that placement. We do the same thing outdoors. It could be with one leaf, five leaves and putting them up. What we tend to do is find other ways to count. So I do have grade two, three this year. We did on the clothesline one whole leaf and on the opposite side was a very decomposed leaf. So we're sort of looking at part, part, whole. So what's half a decomposed leaf? Three quarters of a decomposed leaf. And that's how we ended up doing our clothesline. I'm struggling with the... There we go. Uh, this is our example of how uh, spending time consistently outdoors helped us uncover the math curriculum. So we were at that garden space for, oh goodness, seven days in a row, obviously over the weekend and followed into that second week. And now the learners were starting to beginning to notice new things, asking really interesting, deeper questions. So the girl here asked, do all daffodils have the same number of petals? Well, let's go count. So they had their clipboards on, we're doing some data collection, they're counting all the petals, they're mapping where that um, daffodil is, they would go to a different area, count, label. So that math learning was so deep from visiting a simple little garden space. It wasn't a huge little garden area. There were three different beds uh, right below some people's um, <laughs> their windows in their classroom. There was like a little section of daffodils and a little garden bed of more daffodils down the way. So we went and counted all the daffodil petals. Uh, this is something that you can scan. Most of us, because we've already done this session, a lot of really great ideas have been uploaded to this Padlet. So if you would like to scan the QR code, I've also put the Padlet link under a Word document under our Google Drive. <laughs> so you can add some ideas of other lesson plans for how to teach number sense indoors and outdoors. So then we can continue learning from one another. All right, our second strand is computational fluency. So our big idea with this is understanding the relationship between addition and subtraction. The curricular competency we're focusing on right now for this lesson was communicating our math in, in different ways. And the content area was decomposing the number 20 into smaller parts. So this game is called knock, knock on the clock or knock off the clock. Um, it, Usually you can just start with addition subtraction. Um, now with my grade two, three, some of us are starting to learn how to include multiplication and division, but you can draw your, your clock on a piece of paper, maybe on a whiteboard. With my kindergarten class a few years ago, we just used playing cards and then just flip the playing card once you want to cross off that number. So I roll my dice, six and two. What's six plus two? I'm gonna cross off the eight, roll again. Six and two, oh, I got it again. What's six minus two? Cross off the four or turn the number four playing card over. Again, it's very similar to number talks when we're thinking about how numbers are composed and decomposed and being really flexible about our thinking and then communicating our mathematical understanding with a partner, if you're gonna play it with a partner. 
taking our same math lesson outdoors. This was a beautiful sunny day and I had already planned to do this on whiteboards inside so I just grabbed some sidewalk chalk. What I had indoors was just on some um, index cards, some simple equations for a number talk and I handed it out. Now on the back were some reminders about different ways that you could represent your thinking. So I had a, we have a number line, an open number line, um, a picture of a hand because it's okay to use your hands to count, a blank 10 frame, oh, I'm forgetting one, I wish I had it with me, uh, but there's some visual reminders. On this side, two plus three, or for my grade threes, I might have um, like a four part question. Two plus three plus 18 minus one equals. So one learner drew an open uh, number line up at the top. That was a great way to represent their thinking. Um, other index cards had puzzles like this. So what's next? Again, this is something that we've done in the classroom, looking at the patterns of our hundreds chart and how that relates to addition and subtraction. So I had that on an index card. They transferred it using sidewalk chalk and then filled it in. <clears throat> Uncovering math outdoors, when we're thinking about, again, this relationship between addition and subtraction, we go on daily nature walks. Sometimes they are open-ended. We might just ask them to walk by themselves so in a straight line, or maybe they have a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder partner with a friend. Sometimes we also walk with a specific prompt in mind, like let's look for seasonal changes, let's look for 2D shapes, let's look for um, patterning. On this particular walk, so the picture with the leaves, we were observing the different shapes of leaves that had already fallen to the ground. Some students were collecting handfuls, like heaps, <laughs> on our nature walk. So by the time we finished, and we always end our nature walk in the middle of a soccer field, so there's no more trees near us, we're in the very center, and they've got these heaps of leaves. So they put them on the ground, and they're starting to count them and compare. Oh, I've got 20, I've got seven. One boy was clearly competitive and disappointed that his friend had collected a lot more leaves than he did. And so what he did is he started ripping his leaves in half. And then that just started a fury of all the students ripping their leaves into little bits and pieces. Obviously it was fun and exciting, so we let it happen. It's playful. They're learning about numbers being broken up into smaller numbers. However, it's sort of the opposite because they started with one and now they have 10. Uh, we didn't talk about that part. What I did talk about is I pulled a few of the learners that I thought were ready and I asked them to come over and I asked if this leaf that they're holding was 10, break it in half and let's see which eat each part could represent. So I'll play the video. Go for it. So he broke it. Now you can't hear him, but he says seven and three. And so I asked, why do you think it's seven and three? And he said, well, it's more than half, so it's not five and five, but it's not quite 10 and zero. <laughs> so, you know, that's pretty good thinking. Now, the other example there, with the birds in the tree is from our weekly bird observations. And I love watching birds in general, but we were walking past and we were noticing the birds go from the tree down to the grass field, back up to the tree, back down to the field, so back and forth. And so we were watching this for a while, so long that I thought, you know, I feel like we could start drawing something out. So I asked a few learners, they ran in, they grabbed our whiteboards, they came back and we sat and we were all drawing the tree, drawing the birds on it, drawing the field, and then we drew what we saw happening. So three birds came down, and so we did eight minus three equals da da da, da. and then we erased it, drew our next one. Oh, they went back to the tree, so now it's eight, and the three flew back, so eight plus three. And so it lasted for quite a while. Uh, again, a great natural way of emergent learning, watching birds and trying to figure out that relationship between addition and subtraction. Go for it. Go for it. Oops. <laughs> can't. There we go. Again, uh, you can upload your ideas to the Padlet. So our next one is about patterning in algebra. 
A big idea here is again noticing about patterns and figuring out which parts repeat. Our curricular competency is about explaining and justifying our mathematical ideas and decisions and the content area is looking at repeating patterns that have multiple attributes. So we have something similar to this in our classroom. Now if I had younger learners, I probably wouldn't just put the core on the paper. I would show that it actually is repeating because this might be tricky if I had kindergarten. Um, again, taking this idea outdoors, we set up the outline of the mosaic and in with their buddies, they filled in each different, each different buddy had a different section that they could fill in with a different pattern. Again, very similar to what we would do outside. It happened to be a nice cloudy day. And so we took our math lesson and we brought it outside for a refreshing change of atmosphere. We can also ask them again on index cards. I would have a bunch of different challenges on index cards that they can come. I would hand it out, exchange it for a new one. Please um, find a way to represent an ABC pattern. They went out and made one. And then my next friends might say, take an existing pattern and translate it into a different formation. So now they might have to go find a cone, a stick and a leaf, and then find a new way to represent that pattern in a different uh, manner, different material. Now this one was after, again, visiting our garden beds for, and not every day, we don't visit our garden beds every day, but definitely every week, we noticed that the, the middle of the sunflower has a really interesting pattern to it. So the girls kept going back to the sunflower every week. And after a while that I thought they would be able to sustain it and were ready for it, I introduced the idea of the Fibonacci sequence. So we started uh, counting, writing on a piece of paper, noticing the increasing pattern between each number. We went and found some cones that also had that same patterning. So again, that was based off of their interest in something outside and then I waited for that spark and just sort of gave them a little nugget and then they took it from there. The other thing that I love doing when it comes to patterning outside to help us get to know the land a bit better is looking at the three different ways that um, the leaf growth pattern. So I don't start with three, I usually start with just alternate and opposite. World isn't too common, you still find it, but so much so that I like to really just focus on the first two and then we can introduce the third later. So when we are trying to model this with our body, because we have lots of kinesthetic learners in our class, I start with the opposite one. Let's pretend my body, the center of my body is the stem and out of the node come two uh, leaves. And so one node, two leaves, everybody hold your arms up. Excellent, that's an opposite growth pattern. Alternate growth pattern, I've got one node, one leaf, and then down goes the stem and my leg will stick out in the opposite part of my body. So then we can just play a little game, opposite, alternate, opposite, alternate on your nature walk, put it on a little piece of paper, go look for those different patterns out in nature and then see how that helps you look up those plants in a field guide because that patterning will definitely help us identify it. Okay, here's a little YouTube video on positional patterning. Mathematics is the study of patterns and relationships. In this video, we are going to explore and expand our understanding of what patterns are and where we can find them. As an educator in the primary years, I often find myself getting stuck with a narrow lens of what a pattern can be. A simple AB, ABC, or ABBC pattern. In our BC redesign curriculum, positional circular and increasing patterns are elaborations introduced in grade two within the content area of exploring complex repeating patterns. I find a lot of inspiration for circular patterns in artwork, such as Susan Point, a local Musqueam Coast Salish artist. Examples of increasing and growth patterns can be easily found on Fawn Wynn's website, visualpatterns.org. However, I find resources to be limited when it comes to finding positional patterning. I will focus on two learning intentions of positional patterning. The first is related to mathematical language development. Positional language 
includes introducing words like after, between, beside, next. The other learning intention is related to reproducing concretely and in drawings, describing, extending, and creating positional patterns. So let's become nature pattern detectives. We're gonna start by collecting natural materials and creating our own positional patterns. On our nature walk, we collected some cones we found on the ground and began exploring. How could we label this pattern? A, A, B, A, A, B. Is there a way to use positional language to describe the pattern? Tall, tall, long, or maybe vertical, vertical, horizontal? Other investigation prompts could include, can we use other materials to reproduce the same pattern? What comes next in the pattern? How can we extend the pattern to the left or to the right? What is the same or different with these patterns? What else can we create using natural materials? How can we describe this positional pattern? One on the bottom, two on top. What comes before or next? How would we describe this pattern? What language would we need to introduce? Flat, stacked on top, in between, tall. We could extend this lesson by encouraging students to translate their patterns using a different medium. Maybe instead of a concrete example, we can use an action or sound to represent it. Maybe clap, snap, jump. We can also go for a positional pattern scavenger hunt. Where can we find examples in our school grounds? How would we convince a friend that it's a positional pattern? What language would we use to describe it? Is there a pattern to how the branches grow on this tree? Have fun with identifying and creating your own positional patterns. Math and Trying to scan over, there we go. So it's a really nice video that you can share with your students just on YouTube. Okay, moving on to geometry and measurement. So with this uh, lesson that we've been exploring, our big idea is about describing, measuring, and comparing spatial relationships. Our curricular competency is about developing, demonstrating, and applying mathematical understanding through play. And the content is comparing 2D shapes and 3D objects. I love pattern blocks, tangrams. I could play those every day. I think it's so interesting and definitely a skill that I need still support with is that spatial relationship. So if I've got my yellow, how many blue do I need? How many green do I need? And then trying to introduce the language of the shapes from there. We're also using both standard and non-standard forms of measurement in our classroom, as long as our learners remember that for measurement, we need a number and a unit. So if I'm going to ask how long is your table, it's not five, five what? Five pencils, five erasers, five rulers. And so encouraging the proper mathematical vocabulary during our um, measurement um, inquiries. Here's a fun example of, again, taking what we were doing inside in terms of measuring tables, using standard and non-standard forms of measurement. Uh, we gave, again, index cards. I love a good index card because uh, I get to reuse them. I gave every student an index card with a number and a unit, so 10 feet long. And what they were supposed to do is, again, I love, I love estimation. So 10 feet long, okay, my foot is about that long, all right. Try to guess how long of a line you need to make for it to match 10 feet. So I'll show what this boy did. Seven, eight, nine. nine. So it goes back, seven, measures it, adds it on top. Perfect. So again, we're combining this idea of measurement and estimation, which is such an overlooked skill in our math curriculum, but it's so important. 
Uh, and then he went and I would give him a different index card to try to, again, estimate, measure, and adjust the line from there. Another type of measuring activity we can do, inside the classroom we have different color palettes. Outside, we can make the connection between measuring colors and matching colors in nature. Again, I never really thought of the vocabulary, the math vocabulary needed in order to describe how dark a color is getting and sort of the, the range of adding more color to make it darker because there's a lot of mathematical thinking in that art process. There we go. Another example of uh, being outdoors and sort of uncovering the math connections is because how rainy it is, we've got lots of mushrooms growing on our fields in the little green belt area. Mushrooms are everywhere. So let's stop, observe, never touch. That's one of our biggest rules in our outdoor classroom. Never, never hands on our mushrooms. Uh, if we need to, we would use a comp. We've got little compact or makeup mirrors that have um, mirrors on both sides. So you like open it up like a clamshell and you put it underneath a, um, a mushroom so that you can see the gills without breaking the mushroom or touching it getting too close. But let's look at the shape and size of the caps. Is it convex? Is it conical? Is it flat? Is it funnel shaped? Or our kids are calling it V shaped right now, which is great. It's still identifying shapes and learning how to describe it using uh, different words. We can also look at the size and shape of different holes in snags. Now, I really wish I remembered what nature book I got that uh, worksheet from. I have been looking for about a month because I knew I was going to include it in this presentation. I haven't found it yet, but as soon as I do, I will hand it out to people. But a snag, so a tree that's no longer living. Um, birds love to, woodpeckers, uh, so many different birds. Chickadees, they're the secondary cavity nesters because they're not the ones that actually make the hole or the cavity. But the next year, the chickadee would move in. The size and shape of those cavities would be an indicator of what type of bird lives there. So we're gonna go for a nature walk. We've got our, our comparison chart right there. We find a, a hole, we look at it. Oh, it's one of these four types of birds that might live here. Let's look it up in a field guide. Does that bird actually live in our area? We'll look at the range maps of different birds. And again, that is so deep and that takes us a long time now we're going to map it. Now we're going to measure it. So it can just get deeper and deeper the longer we spend out, outside in that particular area. That center image is a picture of a type of lichen called Usnea. It's also called Old Man's Beard. It grows one millimeter-ish a year. And so again, thinking about measurement and estimation, Find an example on the ground, because it's so sensitive, one millimeter a year. Never pick it from a tree, but after a windstorm, it's always going to be on the ground, falling, falling down. Then we can safely hold on to it and examine it. I wonder how old that usnea is. Now, you definitely know it's usnea because if you pull it really gently, you will see it expand. It's got a lot of elasticity to it. If it snaps right away, it's really hard and thick. It's not oozing. It's a, a look-alike version. Um, but now let's go for a nature walk and I'm going to give you a number, maybe 50. Find Usnia that you think is about 50 years old. Find Usnia that you think is 100 years old based off of, again, knowing how big one millimeter is. Puddles. I love puddles. There are so many different ways you can measure puddles. How long it is, wide it is, deep it is. Um, I sometimes I've stood in the middle of a puddle with a big measuring measuring stick and I we one at a time measure how high you can splash me. Um, sometimes we put them uh, lengthwise sort of similar to this and how if you're running into the puddle and jumping how far can you make the splash go. We can also do um, a measuring through geometry with our puddles. We've taken a piece of blue paper and done a blob, cut out a blob shape, give everybody a different piece of blob, <laughs> 
and look for a puddle twin. Now, most likely they're not gonna find the exact shape of a puddle, but that's not really the point. The point is to observe a shape, make comparisons, look at uh, how wide it is on one side, how narrow it is on the other side, and doing a lot of compare and contrast, and it's so much fun. Ah, oh my goodness, next. There we go. All right, this is a short video on lines and shapes. So where can we find lines and shapes on our nature walk? So we've got lines that hang off trees, <clears throat> lines that go side to side, lines that go up and down, the chunky lines, the different shapes. How does that help us identify this tree, the stringy lines? Really long lines, short lines, the raindrop leaf shape, so now we're looking at how lines form different shapes. The spear leaf shapes that have that really toothy edge. The butterfly leaf shape of a salmonberry plant. Different shapes of flowers. So that's circular, spherical, cone shaped or triangular. And then the lines on the outside versus some lines and shapes on the inside. So what other lines and shapes can you find on your nature walk? So again, very simple, but very, very engaging. Okay, our last math strand here is on data and probability. Our big idea is looking at what stories data tells us. The curricular competency is about visualizing to explore mathematical concepts, and the content is on the likelihood of familiar events using comparative language. So here's a bunch of dice, here's a chart. We're gonna do 10 rolls, do a tally mark, see which number is the most popular, which number is the least popular. So we roll 10 times, tally, tally. Wow, I got a lot of fours. I got no ones, I got one, two, that sort of thing. Now do your second column. We'll do 10 more rolls, getting up to 20, and let's do a comparison between the numbers that you got up into 10 and the numbers that you got up into 20. How similar or different are they? Oh, come on. <laughs> Next. I don't know why I'm so bad at that. Very similar to the graphing and data collection we do inside, we can do that outdoors. This is an example of our monthly bird checklist. So I did set up the first four birds there that I knew we would see most likely out on our school grounds. And I left two columns of other. So in our bulletin board outside, it's a year of outdoor learning in our outdoor classroom. And so we have our September bird checklist, our October, the whole year. Uh, and we bring this outside every time on our nature walk and every time we see a bird, we color it in, we document it over time. It's been really engaging. We can also use ourselves to collect information and display it as a graph. So using ourselves to make little bar graphs like this. And then we can quickly come and use sidewalk chalk if we want to add another layer, but you don't have to. <laughs> Now, again, using uh, nature by spending time outside and then figuring out the math connections from there. I'll start on the picture on the left so you can see it's a big tree and somebody's hands are sort of above their head, holding it up high. It's really hard to see, but up in that tree, there is a, quite a large bird nest. And so what I was asking is for us to collect data on where the bird nests were. So we were going on walks, we were doing tally marks, we were mapping where the bird nests were. And this day we went a bit further on our nature walk and we saw an abnormally large bird nest. And I asked them to show me with their hands, again, estimation skills, how big they think the nest was. All right, you think it's about that big? Now show me with your hands how big you think the bird would be. Awesome. All right. Now, if the bird is about that big, how big do you think the egg might be? Awesome. Right? So again, a really nice uh, land-based example, emergent learning, 
and estimation skills and including data collection on where the bird nests are. The middle photo here is from a book, uh, Juliet Robertson's book, uh, Messy Maths. She has an entire chapter on data collection. And this was a really fun example. We do a lot in our classroom, something very similar, just a really simple chart like this in order to collect data and graph it and sort it into groups. So stick or it wasn't stick, sorry, we just did sticks last week. So that's what I have in my head. Rocks that are gray and rough, rocks that are gray and not rough rocks that are not gray but rough and rocks that are not gray and not rough. Really a simple, really great for that comparative language and collecting data. Here's the, an example of how we use different mirrors to go underneath the mushrooms. Now the reason I put this picture here is because we, because of how rainy it is and mushrooms are everywhere, we are collecting data on the type of mushroom, how many we see, and then now we're also mapping the locations of these different mushroom colonies. So it's, it's again, really growing into quite an interesting uh, mushroom inquiry. There we go, I'll skip the Padlet one, here we go. Um, in the Padlet, I have given an example of a lesson, a math nature lesson template. What I love doing if I was in person with staff meetings or at a pro D with your entire school is going through different places outside and figuring out what can you do there. So for instance, if we were seeing this plant that had that opposite leaf growth pattern, what else could we do? What kind of math lesson could we do on Monday based off of that place and what you see? You got that wire fencing most of us do at our school. It's right, my favorite right now. It's my favorite area. Uh, what math lives there and how can we use that space to do more math inquiries? Can we use it as a vertical learning space? Can we use it for nature weaving or hanging up other forms of documentation? If you've got some logs, can you rearrange those logs to make a pattern? Again, a positional pattern or some other form of looking for shapes in lines. Can you use that tree for uh, data collection or geometry? There's so many different opportunities. <laughs> so here's an example of what that math lesson plan looks like that you can fill out, but also look at the weekly planner. So if I'm thinking about that one math concept, how does it develop over the week in your outdoor classroom? Or if you're thinking about your week plan, consider that one space if it's uh, your garden beds. Monday, how am I gonna introduce number at my garden beds? Tuesday, how would I think about patterning? Wednesday, at the same place. Wednesday, how am I gonna go to that garden bed and now do geometry? Thursday, how am I gonna do data collection at that same place? So again, every time you visit, it just gets that little bit deeper. I'm not going to play this because it's a, a, a recording and you don't need time to fill out your lesson plans, but this is again a YouTube video. Uh, you can see in the corner it's called From the Trees by Brandon Grant. It's a song that I actually wrote, but I had Brandon who is incredibly talented. He's from South Africa, so I have a strong connection there. Um, he, he sings it uh, on his guitar. It's quite a beautiful little um, ah, it's quite a beautiful song. Next, here we go. So this is the final section where we're going to look at the four seasons of math again through the each five of these math strands. So uh, um, in autumn, in fall time, it really symbolizes a time for change, harvest and abundance. We can do things like counting, collecting and sorting acorns doing a clothesline of color measurement, darkest to lightest, uh, looking at leaves as whole and decomposed or that part, part, whole thinking. Uh, we can graph seasonal changes. I mean, really the, the list could go on and on. What I want to show you is this one. So math and leaves particularly, because we've just had leaves everywhere. Here's all five math strands and then a prompt that will help inspire some mathematical inquiry. How many leaves are on this branch? How do leaves falling off a tree relate to subtraction? How do leaves falling on the ground relate to addition? 
How do patterns on a leaf help us identify the plant or tree? How do the leaves look alike? How are they different? We can organize the leaves into groups, but more importantly, how does organizing the data that way help you understand the land better and help you understand the math? We can also collect acorns. We've got lots of oak trees, as I said. So let's figure out and count how many acorns are under one oak tree. Again, how do acorns falling off a tree relate to subtraction? Or how can you use acorns to make a pattern? How are acorns similar or different? Can you organize the acorns into groups with caps, without caps, size, shape? Moving into winter, it's a time uh, for rest, for hibernation, for comfort. We can collect and observe snowflakes, build 2D and 3D shapes with snow, measure volume uh, and capacity with snow. Uh, and with number, we can count snowflakes on a black piece of paper. Think about, again, how snow falling to the ground is related to addition. How can we use snowflakes to create a pattern? How can we measure snow? And again, making different types of shapes or snowballs and organizing that into some sort of like collecting data that way and organizing it. In springtime, a start uh, time for starting over, renewal, growth, we can record soundscapes of birds, which is a beautiful thing. I recommend going onto All About Birds website and playing bird song hero it will teach you it'll show you the students and you a video on how to um draw and how to observe and how to understand what a soundscape is so it'll play a bird song and so the soundscape will go like this and so they learn to hear it and see it and it really helps stick into their memory and then you can go outside and do bird soundscapes, which we're doing right now, it's so fun. Uh, you can go out and measure new growth of flowers. You can count petals on flowers or count the berries on plants. See if there's any similarities to the most common number that you see in nature, hint, hint. <laughs> uh, math and birds, again, count how many birds are in the tree, how many are in the sky, on the field, in the bushes. How do birds landing on the ground relate to addition? How does observing flight patterns help us identify the bird? Because there are some very common flight patterns. Uh, there's something called undulating, uh, which looks sort of like a roller coaster. Um, that's common for a lot of our songbirds. How are these birds alike and different? Again, if you're gonna look it up in a field guide, how can you organize those birds into groups? And then how does organizing that data help you understand the birds a bit better? Uh, summer mathematical discoveries, the last uh, few slides here. It's a time for rest and happiness and adventure. Uh, we're gonna record daily temperature changes. So many explorations that you can do with water and, and definitely with flowers. So how many petals does this flower have? How do flowers growing in the garden relate to addition? Where do we find patterns in flowers? How are these flowers alike? organizing the groups into flowers, etc. So I know I did that quickly. It's just because I've already done the session once today and I did my other session. So definitely trying to wrap it up. But for those of you who weren't able to um, join us earlier, I hope you were able to access this and find it useful. Um, don't hesitate to, I'll put this screen